Farm Week is a production of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Today on Farm Week, who is the world's top corn exporter? The answer might surprise you. Mississippi State University joins forces with an agricultural college in India. In Southern Gardening, the Camellia. It's hardy, it's a symbol of the South, and they produce winter color. In the markets, corn is pressured by weak exports and weak ethanol demand. While the cattle inventory report indicates that herd rebuilding might begin if the weather cooperates. In the feature segment, they're more than pretty faces, they're rodeo queens. Samantha Golden and Paige Nicholson represented Mississippi in 2012. They enjoy we representing really agriculture. Agriculture in every area, not just the um, cattle and horse industry, because it, it truly is astonishing that only 2% of our country feeds the remaining 98%. I spent the year traveling throughout our country representing our rich agriculture history here, as well as the Western way of life. Good day everyone, I'm Leighton Spann. Artist Ford has a day off. Here in the United States, we like to think of ourselves as the breadbasket to the world. That's still true, but if you had to name the world's number one corn exporter, what name would you say? Well, according to an article on agrimoney.com, the answer is Brazil, not the United States. The corn marketing year for 2011-2012 just ended in Brazil. The U.S. Department of Agriculture estimates Brazil exported 21.5 million metric tons for the year, almost double the previous year. Richard Feltz of R.J. O'Brien in Chicago said it's the first. He pointed out that several factors helped this to happen. The U.S. crop was reduced by drought, while Brazil had a record second crop, which we might refer to as a double crop. Some Brazilian farmers plant corn after they harvest soybeans and the weather in the past marketing year helped this second crop to achieve record numbers. Felt says while the U.S. may bounce back to be the number one corn exporter, this is significant for Brazil. Some of the market share gained by Brazil this year will be permanent as some of its new customers return to buy again. In December 2012, delegates from Angrao, an agricultural university in India, visited Mississippi State University to collaborate on ways to manage food shortage issues in coming years. Visiting scholars, professors, and ministers of agriculture are interested in technologies being developed at MSU that they can take back to India to maximize production there in their agricultural practices. Farm Week's Amy Taylor reports. With the nation of India having one of the fastest growing populations in the world, university delegates from Angrao are concerned about future food shortages. Ruben Moore, associate director of Mississippi Agricultural and Forestry Experiment Station and Forestry and Wildlife Research Center at Mississippi State University, discusses why delegates from Angrao chose to visit MSU. They're doing a lot of research that's similar to ours and they want to tap into some of the things that we're doing so that we can help them and they can also help us. They were particularly interested in uh, some of the commodity work that we're doing, uh, particularly cotton. Cotton is a big uh, commodity in the, in the country of India. Uh, they were also interested in peanuts. They're doing a lot of work in peanuts. They wanted to see harvesting equipment in peanuts, harvesting equipment in cotton. So we were able to show them some of the equipment we have on campus. Uh, they were also interested in castor. Castor is, uh, production is big in India. In fact, uh, a high percentage of the castor we use in the United States comes from India. It's used high in cosmetics. Uh, uh, lipstick has a high percentage of castor oil. So, yes, uh, castor is very important. Moore says with India's fast-growing population, the nation might have the highest population in the world by 2050. Therefore, it will be important to develop efficient agricultural practices to manage food and fiber demands. 
and growl delegates toured various facilities involving food product research, bioenergy, water quality, and plant and soil sciences. Additionally, delegates met with Mississippi State University President Mark Keenum to discuss current and future plans for working together in managing these worldwide issues. From Mississippi State University, I'm Amy Taylor reporting. The Internal Revenue Service says it's moving back a filing deadline for farmers and fishermen who file on a quarterly basis. Normally, there is a March 1st deadline, but the IRS has moved this to April 15th. The reason? Changes to the tax system caused by the American Taxpayer Relief Act. Farmers and fishermen will not be subject to a penalty, but you do have to request the waiver. An IRS Form 2012-F has to be filed with the return to request the penalty waiver. What plant is a southern treasure that is both colorful and beautiful in the wintertime? Well, in this week's edition of Southern Gardening, Extension Horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman will show us how beautiful camellia flowers can brighten any cool season landscape. are those true southern treasures that provide color and beauty that brighten the cool season landscape. Today I'm visiting with Webb Hart and enjoying his collection of gorgeous camellias. There are two main species of camellia that can be planted and enjoyed in landscapes all across Mississippi, Camellia japonica and Camellia sasanqua. Camellia japonica or Japanese camellia is best known for its large flowers which can be five inches across but there are several variations of flowers. With its bright pink petals with minor red highlights, in the pink is a formal double flower. Julio Nucio variegated is a double flower with pink and white spotted petals. Royal Velvet is a double with dark red petals with contrasting yellow stamens. The other species is Camellia sasanqua or sasanqua camellia. This begins blooming before Camellia japonica with smaller flowers, but in far greater numbers. Leslie Ann is a double flower type with white petals trimmed in deep pink. Yuletide with its bright red petals is an example of a single flower type. The peony type flowers of pink snow displays its frilly light pink petals. Camellia sasanqua is more tolerant of environmental conditions and have more versatility in the landscape, such as tolerating more direct sunlight. As a general rule, camellias will have the best flowering when grown in at least partial shade. The falling needles and other leaves provide a beneficial mulch reducing weeding and maintaining consistent moisture. There are several thousand named camellia varieties, which means you'll have lots to choose from at your local nursery. I'm Gary Bachman for Southern Gardening. Camellias are native to East and South Asia, and in China, they are known as tea flowers. Well, in our feature segment today on Farm Week, they're called rodeo queens, but these young women are more than just pretty faces. Time for the markets here on Farm Week. The top story this week, the USDA's monthly crop and supply demand reports were released at midday on Friday, February 8th. Traders spent much of the early part of the week consolidating positions ahead of all the new numbers. And other stories we're following for you in the markets, the cotton trade draws some fundamental interest and some money. Gulfport apparently escapes a dock strike that would have impacted ag exports, while milk demand in the U.S. continues to slide. The Congressional Budget Office has estimated cotton planted acreage for the 2013-2014 planting season is only nine and a quarter million acres. Now that would be down from the 12.3 million acres planted last season. Many analysts seem to think acreage this low is highly unlikely. Looking at the boards, as of Thursday morning, March and May contracts were trading 40 points lower. According to analyst Darren Newsom, there are signs that this market has support and may be able to hang on without any bounce to the downside. The biggest thing that we've got going on cotton is it has been beaten down so long. I mean, you go back and look at a chart on, on cotton and it's just been straight lining for quite some time. We're finally starting to see this uptick. We've got some money coming back into the cotton and we've got some fundamental interest in cotton as well. 
over the years we've just we just keep reducing the acres and come this next March uh, prospective planning report cotton's supposed to get cut again possibly down into single digits uh, so less than 10 million acres so you know we, we continue to see less area going into cotton smaller production and so when the world does start to look for some cotton prices start to go up and so we're starting to see some investment money uh, move into the cotton market looking pretty bullish it's been a slow grind I mean it, it's slowly starting to work higher but at least we're we're seeing the buying coming from both sides both fundamentals and technical side so uh, that's a good pos positive bullish sign for the cotton market to be able to extend this rally Friday's supply and demand reports, which were released after this edition of Farm Week was recorded, are expected to clarify the question of whether U.S. corn stocks are increasing or decreasing. Dow Jones Newswires reports traders appear to be expecting U.S. stocks to be increased in the report because of a decline in consumption. Analyst Tom Fitzenmeyer says there has been a lot of chatter for a while that we're going to run out of corn. 602 million bushel carryouts too tight and how are we ever going to get by? Well, we, they, they whacked exports on corn in that report in January pretty hard and we, we still even look at today's exports were terrible. We can't even meet those reduced export expectations. So that's one area that's got a problem. Feed usage, you probably aren't going to change too much, although, like I said, if wheat's cheaper, there's, there's a lot of people looking at substituting wheat, so that's not going to help the corn market. Thirdly, you've got ethanol producers. If we rally corn very much, all of a sudden they can't, they're not, they're not profitable. Uh, so there's adjustments getting made. Our trivia quiz this week deals with a Mississippi crop we haven't talked about yet in the markets this week, peanuts. And here's the quiz question. How much of the world's peanut production is used in candy? Is the answer 5% or 20% or 31% or 43%? You'll find out which one is correct in a few more minutes. We're going to pause now for a short break on Farm Week. Coming up, we'll look at the calendar and the second part of the markets. And in the feature segment today, Rodeo Queens. These women are ambassadors for farming and ranching here in Mississippi and across the nation. Committed? Absolutely. People rely on me. I don't take that lightly. Sure, sometimes we get out of sync and things feel forced. That's when the commitment kicks in. You buckle down, hammer it out, and keep it together for everybody involved. So, yeah, I'm completely committed to my marriage. Till death do us part. Commit to your marriage. Before we get back to the markets, let's take a look at the Farm Week calendar. Mississippi Market Ready Training takes place Wednesday, February 13th. The location is the Bost Building on campus at Mississippi State University in Starkville. The hours are 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. If you're interested in selling directly to restaurants and other outlets, Market Ready will get you started. Find out how to build relationships and how to figure out your selling price. There is no registration fee. The Northeast Mississippi Fruit and Vegetable Producers Association Educational Conference and Trade Show takes place February 14th and 15th. The location is the Lee County Agri Center's Magnolia Building. That's on Highway 145 at Verona. $20 will pay your conference fee and association membership. This is a conference filled with great information on growing and selling fruits and vegetables in Northeast Mississippi. Producers already in the business will speak as well. Organic production and agritourism will also be covered. Go to our Farm Week website at farmweek.msucares.com for information on these and other events. Now let's check out this week's Farm Week snapshot. A tentative agreement between shipping lines and longshoremen is preventing a strike that would have shut down Gulfport on the coast, as well as most other East Coast and Gulf Coast shipping points. Officials say a work stoppage at Gulfport would have adversely impacted major outbound shipments of U.S. pork and U.S. beef destined for overseas markets. The cattle inventory report released February 1 showed the smallest U.S. herd in 61 years. However, many analysts zeroed in on something else in that report, 
the number of beef replacement heifers increased 2% to almost 5.5 million head. The website MeetingPlace.com reports that analysts on average expected the replacement number to actually decline. Now, whether this increase reflects a rebuilding effort and that the nation's herd is starting to increase remains a hotly contested question. Some traders say the ongoing drought conditions in many parts of the country make any significant herd expansion unlikely. Turning now to the dairy industry, declining demand for milk and higher feed costs have been putting the pinch on this portion of the livestock sector. Mike Pearson has more. Fewer consumers are hitting the dairy aisle at the grocery store these days, and that's translating to less demand for milk. While demand for yogurt, cheese, and other dairy products is on the rise, U.S. per capita milk consumption has fallen nearly 30% since 1975. One factor is increased competition. Another is the fact that children, historically large consumers of milk, make up a smaller portion of the population. Milk companies and retailers are looking to boost sales through a number of strategies, including the push of smaller, more convenient packages and healthy-oriented varieties, including protein-enhanced products aimed at fitness buffs. It's imitation milk-making time. I've got the soybeans. I had them first. Kids, kids, there are plenty of ingredients in imitation milk to go around. The dairy industry is promoting natural aspects of its product to counter growth and alternatives made from soy, from almonds, and even water. Retail dairy prices are not helping the industry's case. Last year, milk prices soared 9.2%. The Got Milk ad campaign, started nearly two decades ago by the California Milk Processor Board, is leading the campaign to get milk back into the nation's refrigerators. Always remember, real milk is the real deal. The board also plans to display the real seal prominently on its products to distinguish them from plant-based products. There was some encouraging news for the U.S. farm-raised catfish industry this week. A recent study shows the decline in U.S. seafood consumption is believed to have bottomed out last year, 2012. In addition, U.S. producers' revenues are forecast to increase over 1% a year for the next four years. The Catfish Institute says the farm-raised catfish industry is the largest aquaculture industry in the United States. Before this week's feature story, our trivia answer for you this week, it is B, 20% of the world's peanut production is used in candy. The two leading ladies of Mississippi Rodeo had an exciting journey during 2012. They handed their crowns over to their successors in January. Miss Rodeo Mississippi Samantha Golden and Miss Dixie National Rodeo Paige Nicholson travel the state and the country representing the sport of rodeo as well as the Dixie National. Since rodeo is derived from farming practices, they say being a rodeo queen is not just about promoting a sport, but about representing the influence agriculture has on our nation. Farm Week's Amy Taylor first gave us this story in November. While serving as Mississippi's very own First Ladies of Rodeo, Miss Rodeo Mississippi, Samantha Golden of Meridian, and Miss Dixie National Rodeo, Paige Nicholson of Starkville, are glad to say they have covered a lot of ground in promoting a sport that has such a rich heritage. Since rodeo began in the 1800s, it's developed into a popular form of entertainment for those who enjoy the thrill of bull riding, barrel racing, roping, team pinning, bronc riding, and many more timed events. Paige Nicholson says there are two main reasons she loves rodeo. The first one is the rich heritage of the sport of rodeo and the fact that it's the only sport that's derived from an actual job and that cowboys used to work on the ranch all day and then get together to show off the skills that they had honed. And the second thing is the people that surround rodeo, whether it's the contestants, the queens, the announcers, even the fans are all just a special breed of people. Like when people come together for a rodeo, it's like a family. It's my responsibility to be visible at the rodeo, to answer questions for the fans, and also to do a ride in at the beginning of the rodeo on my horse so that everybody sees me and knows that I'm there and knows that I'm available to them. Additionally, Nicholson's responsibilities include making television and radio appearances to get the public excited about the Dixie National Rodeo in Jackson, Mississippi. 
Samantha Golden, Miss Rodeo Mississippi, serves the same roles, except her title also includes competing at the National Rodeo Finals in Las Vegas for Miss Rodeo America. She says rodeo queens help create a new awareness of the link between the sport of rodeo and our nation's agricultural commodities. So we've really seen the impact of agriculture in every area, not just the um, cattle and horse industry, because it, it truly is astonishing that only 2% of our country feeds the remaining 98%. I spent the year traveling throughout our country representing our rich agriculture history here as well as the Western way of life. The one thing about rodeo that I've truly learned is once you think you know a lot, you, there's a lot more to learn. There's always something else to learn. There's so much facts and trivia and rodeo knowledge, equine science. In preparing for the national pageant, Golden says it will be important to know everything from the NFR contest agenda to stats on rodeo cowboys and cowgirls. Additionally, the six day long Miss Rodeo America competition will include horsemanship, interview questions, and modeling. Mississippi Commissioner of Agriculture and Commerce, Cindy Hyde-Smith, says she has become a strong supporter of Miss Rodeo and Miss Dixie National since taking office. Being the Commissioner of Agriculture, you know, I want to support all facets of agriculture. And uh, having the Dixie National Rodeo here on the uh, property at the uh, Mississippi State Fairgrounds, you know, that's part of my job to get over there and to make sure everything goes smooth, to make sure that it happens. So, uh, you know, it's just a natural fit. You know, we're cattle farmers. That's what we do for a living. And to come in and be able to support a young lady that represents the industry of rodeo is uh, just a delight. So many people aren't even aware that we have a Miss Rodeo Mississippi. And to just get that awareness out there, to get the uh, highlights out there for her and the awareness that, you know, this is what it's about has been a lot of fun. In showing her support, the commissioner says it's important to understand the expenses involved with being a rodeo queen. All of the dresses, hats, boots, jewelry, and traveling costs are definitely not cheap. Therefore, Commissioner Hyde Smith helped host the Buckles and Crowns Dinner Dance fundraiser to help out. I knew the financial need was, you know, there for any young lady that was attempting this. And so we came up with the idea of doing a dinner dance and involving a lot of the statewide elected officials, a lot of the legislature, and actually got on stage and sang and danced to raise money. And we got our money up front before we started singing. In response to support from the commissioner and other sponsors, Samantha Golden says she's grateful for what she's learned from Commissioner Hyde Smith, who she describes as a great leader and role model. I've spent a lot of time with her and she embodies the morals and the character that I would want to portray as myself going into the workforce one day. My years Miss Rodeo Mississippi would not have been the same. I would not have been able to travel and represent our state and our rich culture here if it weren't for the lending hand that everybody has given me. Um, Ralph Morgan and Miss Cindy Hudson Smith have truly gotten behind me this year and made sure that I've had an impactful and important year. Before this year I had not had many speaking obligations and it's grown my confidence as well as being able to speak and my morals have even grown being around so many important people that are so willing and eager to help you it makes you become a better person. Furthermore, Golden says the skills she acquired like self-presentation, responsibility and time management as a student at Mississippi State University will stick with her in the future. Whether you realize it or not, somebody is watching you and looking up to you. So making sure that you always have a smile on your face, you're well spoken, you're presentable, as well as having a caring heart and a lending hand. Wasted time is the only thing you can't recycle. So I've really taken advantage of that statement and applied it this year with my studies as well as the Miss Rodeo Mississippi Association. Golden says her career ambition is to become a spokesperson in the rodeo industry or work for a stock contractor. As for Paige Nicholson, she plans to attend graduate school after obtaining her agricultural information sciences degree from MSU. Nicholson says serving as Miss Dixie National Rodeo Mississippi has created many opportunities and she encourages anyone interested in rodeo to consider participating. If you have any type of passion for the sport of rodeo and you think that you would enjoy representing the Dixie National Rodeo as a rodeo queen, try it. Even if you have never been in a pageant before in your life, because there's not 
one person who is a perfect rodeo queen and there's not one stereotype that we try to follow. If you have a passion for the sport of rodeo, you can do this in your own way and make the Dixie National proud to have you as their leading lady. As she continues honing her horsemanship skills at Covered K Arena owned by David and Sheila Kirkman, Nicholson says she looks forward to seeing what the future holds. The two rodeo queens say they will never forget the support they've received from family, friends, generous leaders, sponsors, and role models. After making an excellent mark in 2012 as Mississippi's first ladies of rodeo, you might say whoever follows in their footsteps will have big boots to fill. I'm Amy Taylor reporting. And if you're interested in more information on Samantha Golden and Paige Nicholson, watch this story again at our Farm Week website or on the Facebook page or on YouTube. And in an update on that story, Paige Nicholson turned her Dixie National crown over in January to Brandy Pittman, the 2013 queen who hails from Bogalusa, Louisiana. Paige's new job will be taking over for Samantha Golden. Paige was named Miss Rodeo Mississippi for 2013. Samantha Golden went on to place in the top 10 in the 2013 Miss Rodeo America contest held in December. In 2010, Kelly Jackson of Eupora, Mississippi won the Miss Rodeo America title. Well, we are at the end of this edition of Farm Week on our next show, Gluten-Free Foods. If you're like me, you may wonder why they're all the rage now. You'll find out what started the demand for gluten-free food products and do we really need those? The answers might surprise you. In Southern Gardening, Pyracantha, this woody plant not only provides color, it's also important winter food sources for many birds. For the rest of the Farm Week crew, I'm Leighton Spann. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.